Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Carlson here with the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all to today's conversation, uh, Who Killed Truth, uh, with the esteemed historian Jill Lepore. I'll introduce her in a minute, but a couple of quick announcements before we get started. Uh, throughout the event, you'll be able to submit your questions uh, either on the Q&A function, if you're using Zoom, uh, or on the chat box function, which is next to this broadcast on YouTube. Uh, and the sooner you submit your questions, the better. Uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, if we don't get your question, though, stick around. Uh, the rest of the panel will stay on after the uh, co co initial conversation. We'll keep this going. And uh, you can join us for a little uh, virtual lobby talk to uh, simulate what we'd be doing in an in-person if the actual event was, uh, we were all convening together. Uh, I wanna extend a special welcome to our audience who learned of this event through a Changing Hands uh, bookstore. Um, we're, uh, we're really pleased to partner with them on this event and also our next one on November 18th on religion and the election. Uh, more on that later, um, but uh, check out our website or sign up for our mailing list for details. Uh, I'd also like to encourage you to purchase a copy of uh, Jill Lepore's new book, If Then, or any of her or other books, if you haven't read them yet. Um, her title is, uh, the title of her new book is If Then, How the Simulmatics Corporation Invented the Future. Uh, you can find a link to that in the Changing, uh, to, uh, Changing Hand bookstores if you go to the, to the chat function. Now, uh, today's event is part of the Center's Recovering Truth Project, which uh, explores how truth serves as a foundation for democracy. Uh, you can learn more about the project. You can watch our videos or even listen to our first podcast, which is coming out this week, uh, on our website or just, just Google Recovering Truth, and you can find that uh, on the web or on uh, Twitter, at Recovering Truth. So we are thrilled to have Professor Lepore with us here today. Uh, she is the David Woods Kemper 41 Professor of American History and Affiliate Professor of Law at Harvard University. She's also a staff writer at The New Yorker and host of the podcast, The Last Archive, a tremendous podcast I would add. Uh, she is an award-winning author of over 10 books, including the international bestseller, These Truths, A History of the United States, which was named one of Time Magazine's top 10 nonfiction books of the decade, not the year of the decade. Uh, it lays out what she describes as a stirring, terrifying, inspiring, troubling, earth-shaking epic that is the American experiment. Uh, her writing is as elegant as it is prolific. Uh, her books ask trenchant questions and excavate issues, ideas, events, even people that no one else uh, does. Uh, and her, her storytelling is just exquisite. Uh, her latest book, as I mentioned, um, was just published last month, If Then. Uh, and we really thought that in this fragile, divisive uh, moment, this time when we're living with rampant conspiracy theories, overt lies by political leaders, obfuscation of science, history, even the denial of the truths we hold to be self-evident at times, there is no better person to help us make sense of this, what some are calling our post-truth era, than Jill Lepore. So Professor Lepore, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, also joining me in this conversation are two of my colleagues, uh, professors of religious studies, Tr Tracy Fezenden and Gaiman Bennett, and they are also part of the Recovering Truth Project team. Uh, and I'm gonna turn to uh, Tracy to get us started. Go ahead, Tracy. Thank you, John. Jill Lepore, what an honor to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have stolen the title for our event uh, from your riveting podcast, The Last Archive. The guiding question of season one of the podcast is who killed truth? And to pursue that question, you take us through a century of cases that show us how notions of truth have changed over time. Uh, you show us that we want to imagine truth to reside in mystery, knowledge only God or the gods possess then in facts, the evidence of our senses, then in numbers, and most recently in data. Believing that the truth is in the data brings us to Simulmatics, the subject of If Then, and from there to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and other projects of manipulating human behavior. The last archive ends with a call to renew our democracy. We kill truth when we give up on the idea that we inhabit a shared world. Truth requires, you say, a collective commitment to empiricism. We hold these truths. 
These Truths is also the title of your magisterial history of the United States. And our Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident and goes on to list as self-evident truths, the equality, sovereignty, and natural rights of persons. The self-evident truths of equality, dignity, and rights seem to exist slightly to one side of the trajectory from mystery to facts to numbers to uh, data as the places that we imagine truth to reside. So I'd like to invite you to reflect a little bit on the relationship between these truths, either the, the book or the uh, Jeffersonian aspiration, and the trajectory of truth from mystery to facts to numbers to data that leads us to the Simulmatics Corporation and the cautionary tale of If Then. Great, well, first, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here with all of you. I wish very passionately that we were in a big lecture hall together sitting around a table in the front of a room with the, the warmth of the audience together. Um, but it is, it's an honor to be in conversation with you as part of this really important project that you've all taken on that I, I'm so grateful for. Uh, it's a very challenging moment to do this kind of work. It's challenging to do it from within the academy. And uh, so I'm thrilled to, to be able to participate in conversation with you. You've, you've asked me kind of a whopper of a question. So I'm gonna to try to give a, a somewhat tidy answer that will be artificially tidy. But I wanna take it in one way as an invitation to kind of sketch out the schematic that I use in the last archive to offer up a kind of theory of knowledge that I use in a course that I teach. I've been teaching for many years now at the Harvard Law School called the History of Evidence. Um, that I started teaching because I really noticed that my students were struggling to believe in belief. <laughs> and uh, I felt so responsible for that, that, the, that um, so much of my own training as an academic in a kind of postmodern moment had been about questioning um, uh, and about a certain kind of skepticism that had to do with the position of speakers. And I, I felt that somehow, as that kind of traveled down the generations, that it got to the point where my students really didn't believe in anything, and they didn't know how to tell if something was true. They were very good at telling you what was biased about everything that they might be being taught, but but it was harder for them to tell you what might be true about what they about what what was being presented to them. So I started teaching this course at the law school, and then that kind of turned into this podcast. Um, which is really just a public facing project version of the of, of, of a, a pretty serious seminar. But the argument that I make in the class and then also in the podcast is that analytically at least, it's useful to think about the elemental unit of knowledge as changing over time. I mean, we think about you know units all the time, you know, units of measurement, you know, a, a gram that measures weight or you know, a calorie that measures energy. The, the, you could think about knowledge in that way as well. And so the schematic that I that I lay out in the podcast is that, you know, we, we might think of knowledge if we kind of begin with the Middle Ages um, in the medieval church uh, as as privileging the mystery as 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 the, the elemental and most important unit of knowledge. And a mystery in that sense is what God can know and human beings cannot. Um, you know, the mystery of what happens to us after we die, the mystery of, you know, where we come, where life comes from. Um, there are plenty of other mysteries, but those are some of the bigger ones. And that um, so much of the Reformation and then the scientific uh, revolution and the Enlightenment were about uh, kind of toppling mysteries from their plinth and replacing mixed mysteries with the era of the fact as an element to a fact, sort of an observable act. And um, that uh, with the age of quantification, the 18th and 19th century, the number became the, the elemental unit of knowledge and down to our day where data is that elemental unit. Uh, but data, I argue, is kind of a return to the age of the mystery because data is a kind of knowledge, a body of numerical quantitative knowledge that's so big that we can't process, humans can't process it, only machines can process it, which sort of erects a kind of new priesthood among those people who, who write code for machines and machines then kind of uh, reign over us in, 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 in a strange way. So to the question of then where does um, the Declaration of Independence, that, that discourse, we hold these truths to be self-evident come from, I think of that very much as coming out of the era of the fact, right? So let 
these facts be submitted to a candid world, Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence, that the claim there is that um, the, the erection of this government is not is is not an act of tyranny. It is not the result of an act of force. It is itself an act of observation. And so the Declaration of Independence takes pains to present the part of it that everybody forgets is that most of it is a is a list of offenses and abuses of the king. So here's this body of evidence. It's like a legal case brought forward. Right? Here's this litany of abuses that justify are declaring our independence. And so, and then this is made public because that the there of the fact is very much one that is committed to transparency, right? So that you can, you have to be able to inspect my evidence. Um, so I think of that, that uh, our political, our founding political moment is very much emerging out of this particular commitment to inquiry, to inspection, um, to just to human discernment and out of emerging out of a faith in the human capacity for that, for the capacity to discern the truth after inspecting a body of evidence. And, and in a democracy in that sense, we as citizens have a role that is akin to jurors in a criminal trial, right? The evidence of two candidates will be presented to us. They will offer competing interpretations of the world. We hear both sides of that argument. We inspect the evidence ourselves and we use our human capacity, this celebrated enlightenment era capacity for reason to discern the truth of the matter and therefore cast a ballot. That's very much the, 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 the body of, of epistemology on which the nation itself is founded, I would contend. I think the second question goes to me. Um, I just want to echo Tracy and John and say what a pleasure it is to, to speak with you about these things today. Um, at risk of letting out my inner fanboy, um, this project, uh, your, your book project, if then, um, speaks not only to the project we're involved in, but um, as it happens, I'm an anthropologist uh, of religion, but I work on Silicon Valley. So I'm very much interested in these questions of what we might call the the spirituality of technology, its ethos, mm -hmm. its geist, its ethics, um, mm -hmm. to which your book, If Then, speaks very deeply. And I wanted to invite you to just reflect a little bit on how it is that the story you tell about this company's Simulmatics speaks to our moment in a particular way, um, speaks particularly even to this week we're living in, in which by the day, little persuasive technologies that we hold in our hand are crushing us with disinformation. I should say for those in the audience who are not familiar with the book, it tells, on one level, tells the story of this company that emerges in the 50s and the 60s, if I have that right, um, that is seeking to build a machine that can predict human behavior. And so in really quite a profound way, it's a cautionary tale for where we're living today, only it seems to me that the twist is that the cautionary tale isn't just about technology. In fact, maybe the technology is not the most important part of the story. It's about the kind of character and aspirations of those men who set out to build machines that might predict and thereby control our behavior. So a very long way around of saying, I wonder if you could tell us just a bit more about how you see this book as a cautionary tale for where we are right now. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I um, I guess I became, in some ways, the origins of that book lies. I wrote a book about Wonder Woman a few years ago, which seems completely to one side of this conversation. But in this way, it is very much in the middle of this conversation. The guy who created Wonder Woman in 1941 was quite famous before that for having, as an undergraduate, created the lie detector test. And he went on to get a JD and a PhD in, psycho in experimental psychology. And it was his belief um, that you couldn't really trust humans to tell what was true and what was not true. And, and so that, that a machine would be more reliable. Uh, a lot of early research in experimental psychology had observed that jurors are not don't always get it right. Like the verdict is not always the right one. So you can lie on the stand and people can't always tell. Like we're not actually that we're not perfect at telling when people are lying to us. And he wanted to devise a machine that could do that. So he invented the lie detector, you know, the polygraph with the blood pressure cuff. And his idea was that it should replace the jury. That in fact, in this kind of big epistemic way in which, you know, 
that, you know, from the enlightenment, th this enlightenment notion that humans are capable of, of discerning the truth by observation and the exercise of, of reason, he didn't really believe that. Like psychology was just like it is kind of now, it turns out we're pretty irrational. And so he thought that could be solved by a machine. And although the lie detector never replaced juries, um, in many ways, we're living in an age where what is sometimes called algorithmic truth. Sorry, I have a new puppy and I can't do anything about that. <laughs> so it's gonna be noisy with the puppy. Um, Quite all right, no worries. <laughs> Thank you for inviting um, us into the, your home. <laughs> the idea that, that there's such a thing as algorithmic truth that um, very much the same fantasy, right? Which is not necessarily, uh, malign. I mean, you know, people are trying to do good things like this guy was trying to invite them. He was trying to improve the world. Um, but the idea that um, if we could invent a machine that could tell whether something is true more accurately than we did, would we still use it? That's the hubris that drives me crazy. We shouldn't, right? Like the argument about the lie detector wasn't, we shouldn't, uh, we would use it, we should allow it to replace trial by jury if it's more accurate, it's not even a sensible argument. The reason that we have a jury is so that 12 people sit in a room and together have a conversation about someone else's life and whether or not the evidence is appropriate to issue a verdict and what, you know, what they believe together. It's, it's the, that the building of that community in that room, in that, that world of just, you know, that deliberation of those 12 people reckoning with another human being's soul and the, you know, the fate of that, the course of that person's life, that is, that is its own end. I mean, yes, sometimes they may get it wrong, but the machine deprives us of the ability to, to, to exercise our capacity together to, in, in communion with one another, an intellectual communion to, to attempt to get to the bottom of something. In the same way that um, simulmatics, what they, this, the people machine they devised, you know, people would say, well, eventually, why would you even have anyone vote anymore? If you could devise a people machine, which was an election simulator, right? They gathered all this data together, public opinion data, polls, election data from previous elections, demographic data, and they came up with a simulation of the electorate. And then they just ran endless simulations on it to advise, uh, in this case, the Kennedy campaign, um, how to campaign. And, and cr critics said at the time, but wait, like maybe that would be more accurate than an electorate, but then, then what are we here for? And the guys at Simulmatics didn't, they kind of just didn't get that question. Like one of them said, he was a political scientist said, well, you know, our people machine gives political candidates and office holders information about voter preferences and information is good. Knowledge is good. So the only art knowledge is progress. The only argument against our people machine would be if it's asymmetrical and unfair, but if the if the opposing candidate also had a people machine, well, then that would be fine, right? Like that's the only possible problem. You're like, wait a minute, that's not the only possible. <laughs> what, how is that the only possible problem? That's what fascinates me about, about, that, about that moment because that's sort of still with us. Like I, I'm gonna tell one little Silicon Valley story just because you're thinking about your, if this is sort of an anthropologically minded story. I was giving a talk at San Francisco a few years ago, maybe, maybe as many as eight years ago. And I was out to dinner with a bunch of people and someone was complaining that this guy had moved into her block and he was worked for, I think, Squarespace maybe, and had bought up like three townhouses in a row and it was just making this giant, like just throwing money around. And, and she was talking to him um, about on the street, like walking dogs or something about what all this money was doing to the ability of, people with not that kind of means to live in the city and take public transportation and, and work. And he said, oh, it's okay because we've started a philanthropy where um, we have a program where we teach homeless people how to code. And like that, like, <laughs> like that was the answer to homelessness. It's like, <laughs> like the gap between the question she was asking about the ethics of destroying a living environment in a city and th that you just needed to debug some, like the, the, that gap is, I, I, many of us are finding ourselves, that's different from in many ways, some of the truth 
the way you when you were talking about a truth divide, this is a completely different situation, but it's it matters to what you all are thinking about. Can I uh, put my finger on one thing there and uh, just ask a, a follow up, which is that I think that part of the challenge that we've faced in this saturation of our lives, not only with the technologies, but now with things like disinformation has been precisely this inability on the part of certain tech cultures to face up to the idea that there might even be a problem. And so now that basically no one can deny that there's a problem, um, kind of bigger structural things are beginning to show themselves, which have a lot to do with the history you tell, but I think with a twist on it, and it's a twist that you get to at the end of your book, namely, there's been this buildup over the middle part of the century around this idea that human behavior can be predicted. And so we should build machines that predict it, and then we can manage it in a certain kind of way. To really, if tacitly, an abandonment of that idea, and instead, the idea that we can use these devices to make people predictable, that is to say, we can govern psychic space, mm -hmm. we can govern relational space yeah. in such yeah. a way that it maps back onto the tools that we have and we can manipulate behavior and thereby make it predictable rather than it being predictive per se or a predictive science per se. And at the end of your book, you have this nice mm -hmm. little passage in which you say, of course, like prophecy has been part of the human experience for a very long time. The idea that we should use our machinery to look into the future isn't necessarily a problem. But the idea that we would, you flag the word, you know, predetermine or even predestine human behavior opens us up to a very different kind of religion. Um, and I wondered if you could just say a little bit about the kind of the, 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 um, the malice, as it were, that hides inside that move from trying to predict behavior to building a machinery that will allow us to become predictable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I think I should first say, and just to be clear, because I hope this is clear that, you know, incredibly wonderful, decent people work in Silicon Valley and work at tech companies there and all over the world. Like this isn't some aligned conspiracy of, 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 of evil, you know, ill-intentioned people. Like it's a job, taking care of your family, technological, like what I'm working on is really interesting, interesting intellectual problem. Like I get, I get that. Um, but I do think some of the heads of these companies uh, and, and the, a lot of the culture around funding, the venture capital world um, has rewarded and has a stated preference for ethical heedlessness, right? Like that's weirdly part of the mission of, you know, the, 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 the gospel of disruptive innovation, which is something that I've written about, to kind of celebrates its own heedlessness, to sort of move fast and break things. So... As you say, we might now be at a point where it's undeniable that that heedlessness, you know, is indefensible. But we've been in the same climate change for a long time, and we haven't gotten past, you know, that hasn't led us to action. So, I'm not so convinced that, like now, you, I, I guess one thing I would say about the 20th century as a whole is that in other realms uh, of scientific inquiry, in the 20th century, where there have been staggering ethical lapses, they have yielded a sh tremendous moral shuddering in response. So think about chemists whose work was conscripted as part of the First World War and chemical warfare and how they worked to ban chemical warfare in the aftermath or think about the biological sciences after Nuremberg, after the Second World War, and how they worked to erect in, uh, the field of bioethics and human subject review boards and all that came out of that shuddering moment, or physicists after the Manhattan Project. That same response has not come yet for people working in this field. And, you know, you have to ask, well, well why not? Like, I think a lot of people thought 2016 would be that moment. Like, Wait a wait a wait a minute. We did uh, maybe we did something wrong. <laughs> like let's think about how, how to fix that. Um, and I guess you know a big difference would be money. Like these people are making piles and piles and piles, stacks upon stacks of money. Um, so I'm not sure this is answering your question, but I actually just find that trajectory really interesting because. Uh, the chemists and the physicists and the biologists, most of them were at universities, right? So, you know, and and those who kind of re-entered those realms during the Vietnam War, also the social sciences 
really pulled back after Vietnam and said, you know what, we should not be conscripted by the Department of Defense to do psychological warfare. Like this is not a thing that social scientists can do. You know, Marshall Solins or you know, people who spoke out against Vietnam um, and social scientists complicity with it. These guys, a lot of these Silicon Valley people have repudiated higher education, right? Dropped out, you know, Peter Thiel has these like grants he gives to people for leaving college. Like there's a, there's a, there's a, it's an implicit attack on um, the role of higher education in our public life. So maybe that's another, not just that they're earning a lot of money, but the, the, the production of knowledge for its own sake, for the sake of teaching the young is also not kind of where they, where they live and the air they breathe day after day. Let me uh, come in on this question about uh, the, sort of the production of knowledge and take that though in a somewhat different, uh, a different direction. Um, the short answer, the short question or short version of this question is simply why do we need a national history? Um, but let me give a little bit of backdrop to that. So uh, you note in one of your articles that uh, you know, some American history books fail to criticize the United States. Others do nothing but that. Uh, and this is an acknowledgement that history is divisive, or it certainly can be. And I think we've seen how that dynamic can play out if you look at um, the reactions around and controversies around the 1619 project, or more recently, the, the 1776 commission that the president has, has put forward as a way of teaching patriotism or countering that 1619 project. Y you take a somewhat different approach, um, arguing Okay, first of all, historians must be truth tellers. But your work also toggles, it seems to me, between the work of doing history, learning the truth of the past, as understanding that as worthwhile for its own sake, as knowledge sake, but also the work of civics, which is showing how a shared history helps us understand the past and helps us to be a nation that hold us together as a people. And you've got this book called, you know, this America, the case for the nation. Uh, so with that backdrop, wh why do we need a national history, especially in an era when uh, many people are quite wary of pretty ugly forms of nationalism? Is that, re and, and I guess yeah, I'm saying, I is history gonna bring, is actually, is, is history going to bring people who are very much divided together? <laughs> I don't think that'll, <laughs> I don't think that'll be the solution. Um, I. I I do think, and I would have said as a much younger scholar that, dear God, please, like we do not need national history. Like there's, it's, there's just no daylight between writing a national history and somehow promoting nationalism, you know, by which we would, you know, we generally mean the bad kind of nationalism, a kind of ethnic blood and soil nationalism, because historically national histories propped up those kinds of regimes. And so, you know, after the second world war, American intellectuals, liberal intellectuals back completely backed away from writing national history in the United States and said, you know, this is this is untenable. Also, what we, you know, it promotes a false art and a completely artificial sense of unity with a, a political culture that is a, you know, is all about con contest and disputation and deliberation and debate. Um, it, it's just become too tidy. Uh, and, and meanwhile, there was just an incredible revolution, you know, largely from the left of uh, scholars entering the academy, getting PhDs, doing archival research, writing history that had been completely passed over by, if not willfully, quite willfully buried by earlier historians, and right then in producing, you know, these incredibly rich histories that become part of ethnic studies and what becomes um, women's and sexuality studies, women's history, African American history, Mexican American history, Indigenous studies. So there's this incredibly exciting rich flowering and real revolution in the writing of, of, of US history. Of course, the same thing happens in other parts of the world, uh, but it, it makes it seem, and this is the era which I went to graduate school, completely untenable to try to tell a single story about uh, you know, the American people or the American nation. You know, that just seems so retrograde and, and, and um, you know, it's such a kind of grotesque and almost violent oversimplification. Um, but, you know, I, I changed my mind about that. Um, I changed my mind about that in 2009 because um, uh, the Tea Party movement started and I was fascinated by it because 
the Tea Party movement was animated by a, a deep, among other things, um, a deep desire for a national history. So, you know, it was really led by Glenn Beck on, on his show on Fox News uh, in the afternoon where he gave a US history lesson every day. He outfitted his studio, made it into a little schoolroom with an oak desks and a chalkboard. And he would talk about the greatness of George Washington and the heroism of Patrick Henry. And uh, he gave a kind of, you know, very elementary and, you know, quite outdated account, kind of comic book, simple bedtime story version of, of American history. And it was thrilling, I think, to his viewers. And um, I, I, I was reporting on the Tea Party movement for the New Yorker. I happened to be teaching the American Revolution to undergraduates um, in Cambridge. And I get on my bike at night and I go to Boston and hang out with people from the Tea Party. And their version of the American Revolution was completely different than what the scholarship had taught me and what I was writing myself. And I got really concerned about that gap. And it seemed to me there was an enormous amount of condescension uh, and contempt among academics for people in the Tea Party and their comic book version of the American Revolution and their tricornered hats and whatnot. Um, and no sense of responsibility that it was actually our fault. Like if the, <laughs> if the American public has a screwy version of the American Revolution, like. I'm sorry, but like I teach that, like what, how is that, how am I not partly responsible for that? Um, so it, it really made me think in the absence of scholars who are engaged in the work of humanistic inquiry, writing books that satisfy a need for a people to have an account of their nation as, as a story um, and as a community, and as an idea, then, you know, charlatans and demagogues are gonna offer up that account. And that is really, really dangerous. I just thought Glenn Beck was so dangerous, so dangerous. Um, I had, I'll tell one more quick story about this, which is, but it, it gets to this point uh, because I'm, and I mentioned it because I think of it in the spirit of what you guys are trying to do. I went to go to an event, it was a panel at the National Press Club in DC um, there was a woman from the New York Times who'd written a book about the Tea Party movement on the panel and Dick Army and Tucker Carlson. And Dick Army was the head of this Tea Party organization called Freedom Works. And um, he, his organization had arranged to buy up all the tickets to the event. So when we came into the room, every seat was taken by someone who'd come to DC that weekend for a, a Glenn Beck March, the 9-12 March. I believe it was wearing a Freedom Works t-shirt and a Freedom Works baseball, <laughs> baseball hat. And the, I was like, well, this is going to be interesting. And the whole panel discussion, Dick Army and Tucker Carlson kept trying to bait me as like some communist from, from Cambridge. And the audience kept expecting that I would be pilloried for, you know, for this. And I just kept kind of lecturing about the American Revolution. Oh, and there's another story about James Madison that I really wanted to tell. And afterwards, all these people, these Freedom Works people came up and said, oh, I'd really love to take your class. Like, like, they, they, like they just didn't, this is not a version of the story of American history that they, you know, they didn't know most of this stuff. It's, and why should they? You know, they're, they're it's, uh, yeah, a truck driver, a nurse, and an elementary school teacher. Like, this is not what they do. So it just made me feel like I had an obligation to, to do my job better because of what I, I happen to teach American political history. Like if I taught medieval, you know, French religious history, I wouldn't feel the same public obligation. So actually you're saying that in a way you thought given that the receptive um, uh, hearing that you had from some of these folks that would be on the other side of the divide that actually some kind of common history or national history can unite people. People, they were interested, they were engaged. That sounds promising to me. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, there were other uh, there are other public events. I remember distinctly, I was in Seattle once and a couple came up to me after my lecture and said, you know, we really enjoyed your lecture, um, but we wanna make sure that we wanted to correct a misunderstanding that you have, which is, you know, you seem to believe that natural rights are an idea, um, but they're granted by God. And until you can see that, we can't hear what you have to say about American history. And it was a really, and I said, well, like, tell me more, like I try, you know, I had a conversation about that. Um, but that seemed to me 
a, a more difficult obstacle to get past um, because uh, they could believe that and it's true to them and that's fine. Like that's, that's what religious tolerance is, but that's not actually what Thomas Jefferson believed and I as a historian can know that. So it becomes really, you know, like the, what, how they under, understood natural rights comes out of, you know, black evangelical Christians in the 1820s sacralizing the Declaration of Independence and turning Jefferson's quite secular and narrow idea of political equality of men into something beautiful and broad and universal. Like there is that moment, but that's not, um, that is what those evangelicals believed in. It's what the people that came up to me afterward, but as a historian, like I, I, I couldn't see to them the, the truth of that, right? Yeah. Like that doesn't, that doesn't lend itself, that, that act of faith doesn't lend itself to empirical inquiry and which is fine. Like, you know, God bless, but we kind of hit a wall. Yeah, yeah, uh, Tracy, you want to give us uh, maybe the last question if you can make it kind of brief so we can leave sure. some time for, um, uh, for, for audience Q and A. Sure, Jill, thank you so much. Actually, that anecdote seemed very familiar to all of us who teach religious studies. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna talk about the op-ed you uh, published earlier this month in the Washington Post uh, that has generated some controversy. The title of the piece was, Let History Not Partisans Prosecute Trump. And the subtitle was, A Truth Tribunal Is Not the Answer, Preserving Presidential Records Is. You note, among other instances of malfeasance, Trump's propensity to destroy documents in violation of the Presidential Records Act. And you say of calls for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, quote, stopping the destruction of records is where the real fight lies, the rest is noise. Uh, I know you say you don't read your reviews or comments, um, but you have received criticism uh, to the effect that truth and justice cannot wait on what you describe as the writing of history over time through the study of carefully preserved records. So that work, the writing of history over time through the use of carefully preserved records is the historian's obligation to truth. But what about us as citizens? What is our obligation to truth uh, in the meantime or in the moment? Yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up. I will say, first of all, that anyone who's ever published a newspaper article knows that the writer does not see the headline or the subhead until after the thing is published. I don't, I, like, I admire the Washington Post, but I don't think that the head, I, maybe some of the flap up is about how people who maybe didn't even read the article perceived what my argument was. Um, so some people have proposed a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, kind of po if Trump uh, is not reelected. Um, to address essentially the human rights abuses and the, the constitutional malfeasance and corruption of the Trump administration. And I argue, I asked, invited to weigh in on this, I argued against that for a few reasons. A tr the interest of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission often privileges truth over reconciliation. Um, and it's certainly, in, in, historically, like I was trying to lay out the history of these commissions, if you go that route, um, you forswear prosecution. Um, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission by definition offers amnesty to everyone who participates in it. So if what you're interested in is prosecuting people within the Trump administration or in the Trump organization, say, uh, who you think have committed crimes or human rights abuses, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission denies you the ability to do that, to seek that justice. Um, so to read the piece as arguing against kind of an immediate justice is actually to, to misread to misread the piece, unfortunately. Um, I do think that the preservation of records is is of is of crucial importance. And there are those records. Um, whereas in other cases where a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States is arguably called for and has been happening where these have been called for, there's not a question of the destruction of records, there's an absence of records. One of the things the Truth and Reconciliation Commission does is document atrocities that are, have otherwise been left undocumented and where the documentation is, is necessary for healing. So, I mean, obviously the case of South Africa is, is, is the best known case, but you know, the argument that there maybe ought to be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States to really truly confront the institution of slavery, Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, the violence and terrorism of segregation. That is a very strong argument. I, I think there's a really, like there are historical 
records, but there are family stories to be chronicled, photographs to be gathered. Like that is a piece of investigation and reckoning that I could, I am so fully behind. And I think, so, you know, similarly, and I pointed to this in the piece, there are, you know, there's there's been proposed legislation to use a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to finally get the truth out about the stealing of Indigenous families' children and put, you know, ch taking children from their parents, separating children from their parents and sending them off to schools to deprive them of their ties to their people, uh, to their language, to their culture. That's something we, you know, is is really not well enough documented. Where there are, you know, there are family stories that could be chronicled. Um, so I, I mean, I believe in that kind of work, um, but I believe in a democracy, in an ongoing democracy. An election is actually, as I kind of we're, to kind of circle back to where we began, we are asked to issue a verdict on the two candidates uh, and the truth of their claims that their direction that they think the country should go in is the right one. Um, we, the way that a true peaceful transition of power happens is that then um, not only does the loser accept that verdict, but so does the winner, you know, without the extraction of vengeance. Um, so I, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I confess, like, I, I just really don't, I, I, social media is so toxic and poisonous that um, it's I, I can't really speak to you know what you're offering up as specific criticisms. Um, I absolutely believe that um, there are forms of extrajudicial inquiry that are important at certain moments in history and are absolutely called for and are tried and tested means. But actually, the peaceful transfer of power after a democratic election is another one. Okay, at this point, we're gonna invite uh, Sarah Lords to come back onto the screen and join us and uh, get our Q&A with the audience going. Uh, Sarah? Thank you, John. Uh, and thank you, Joel, for that fascinating conversation and Gaiman and Tracy for facilitating that discussion. Um, for those of you who are watching through the webinar, please submit your questions through the Q&A function, not the chat. That'll help me streamline the process a little bit. And for those of you who are watching via YouTube, um, there's a little chat box just to the right of the broadcast. So um, I have been looking at the Q&A and I will try to coalesce everything into certain themes because a lot of you are asking some of the same questions. So the first set of questions discusses American politics and the upcoming presidential election, which is very top of mind for all of us. Um, truth has been a constant feature in the presidential election, both sides have made claims about the accuracy of, the promotion of, the denial of, or the absence of truth. So our first question for, in this theme comes from Morgan, who asks, do you think the Trump administration created a new precedent for the fuzziness of truth? Um, for example, by undermining formerly renowned sources of truth by claiming things such as fake news. Um. I wrote a little bit about this. I wrote an essay a few years ago called After the Fact, um, which I think I wrote during the um, the Republican primary season, because I, I don't know if you remember, but like Ted Cruz had this book called A Time for Cru Truth when he was running in, in 2015. Um, and a lot of the debate among the, the contest among the Republicans was who was telling the truth. Because for a while before all the Republicans decided, you know, after Trump won the nomination and they all lined up behind him, they were the ones who were busy pointing out that, that Trump was a liar. Um, so I wrote an essay that's a little bit of a history of um, calling your political opponent a liar in American presidential politics, which goes very far back, um, really back to the beginning. Um, and so, you know, kind of raises the question of how new is what is going on now and and with Trump. And obviously, um, I think the short answer is almost everything to do with Trump is essentially unprecedented um, because of who Trump is, but also almost everything to do with Trump is also a product of earlier developments. So I, I would say, you know, Fake news, the term has a quite, has an interesting history that goes back to the 1930s. I, I won't go into that, but if you would just to sort of think from the 1950s forward, um, how when the modern conservative movement in the 1950s began to emerge, um, 
it took really close stock of the institutions of arbitration of knowledge in American life. There were the courts, right? They decide what's true. Uh, there's higher education, right? Scholars and scientists who decide, you know, what's true. Um, and there's the press. And um, the kind of long game of the conservative movement was to either undermine or replace each of those institutions. Um, so the concerted assault on the, the press really begins in the 1950s. So you, yes, you get to fake news decades later, um, but that is a, is a you, could, you can follow it out um, as it grows and expands. Uh, and you know, there are really strong arguments to be made that the, the most meaningful turn comes in the 1980s. Um, with the emergence of talk radio. I mean, there had been radio AM stations where people talked, but um, right-wing political talk radio, which can't emerge until after 1987 with the Reagan era repeal of the Fairness Doctrine and the, then the rise of Rush Limbaugh, um, that that uh, takes you know three decades worth of assault on, on the press um, and delivers it to people in a new form that opens up a kind of space for a, a, kind, of, a kind of new kind of deep doubt of the, the reliability of the news um, that then is you know supplanted with cable news. And then what happens in the 90s that the left sort of decides, oh, well, if the right's gonna do that, then we'll do that. that. Um, and you get to kind of a very different place today. The, the trajectory for what happens to the courts is different. The trajectory of what happens to higher education is different. But, but if, you know, for a half century or more, you assault the three institutions that arbitrate tr truth, you kind of get to where we are. Yeah. Can I jump in just real quickly because this is directly on the question of who killed truth. And you're sort of um, uh, looking at the different ways that uh, conservative institutions have, or conservative uh, groups have gone after these arbiters of truth um, or arbiters of, of knowledge. Uh, and you've talked in your, in your book as well about the, you know, how or the Glenn Beck kind of fables about the greatness of the past. But I also want to ask if, um, because you'll hear a lot about this, is that it's, it was uh, the left that gave way to the post-truth era that ushered in postmodernism and the, the sort of the deconstruction of, uh, of, of all sort of so-called assumed truth claims uh, with just the trappings of power holding them up. Um, are, are there many culprits uh, who, who are responsible here in some way or another for, for killing truth? Yeah, I mean, you know, the podcast, which you, you have been gracious enough not to point out the podcast is sort of deliberately goofy. The podcast is, you know, a kind of Raymond Chandler-esque, like, noir -y radio drama investigation, like, as if we could gumshoe our way to who killed truth. And at various points, you know, at one point, I, I say, you know, it's murder on the Orient Express, like, we all had a hand in it, and, and in a way, that's actually the answer. Um, but then um, there's another point where I say, this is like spoiler alert for anyone who <laughs> listen to it. You know, they're really the obvious, the three obvious suspects that people, if you ask someone, you kind of get, you know, postmodernism, Mark Zuckerberg and Donald Trump. And there, you know, there's, there's, there's truth to each of those claims, right? But there is a kind of broader, um, there are, are broader patterns to be discerned, but I but I would say, and I have I think I I have certainly said this in in print before, but that there what happens in the second half of the twentieth century is that the conservative effort to undermine these, in, these very established liberal institutions or institutions that have become quite liberal and are very established, um, and the the kind of postmodern questioning of truth and can anything be known they come from the left and the right and they, they really kind of meet up in the middle in a kind of big bang, you know, <laughs> the whole kaboom. And, and, and there's kind of the end, like who's, who's left standing then? Um, I think actually among the people who are left standing, who are crucial are librarians, school teachers, investigative journalists. Like there are a lot of people that who, you know, who day in and day out are investigating things, coming up with answers and, and offering them up. Um, meeting, uh, you know, scientists, like lab scientists. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to recognize not everybody has like said, oh yeah, you can't know anything anymore by any means. Historians too, we should have. <laughs> Sarah, back to you. 
yeah, uh, questions are pouring in. So thank you all so much. I'm trying to keep up. Um, we have a few questions that touch on the role of race now in American history and sort of the elevation of, of a truth that hasn't been publicized very much, um, which is the plight of Black Americans in the US um, and their history. So towards that end, what are resources um, for healing and resilience um, that you feel are relevant when we are in a massive reckoning with hundreds of years of historical trauma? And similarly, um, how can we foster ecologies of knowledge and communities with tools to engage this sort of work? Um, and that question comes from Tom. Um, yeah, I think that that is hard work and kind of has to be done at every level, but we're mainly talking about, um, I would say, well, you know, the, the main work has to be done in a kind of K-12 educational environment. And, you know, it's a big reason why I wrote these truths where, you know, race is, is central to, you know, there's not a page of that book where race is not central to the story of American history, because that's how I believe it to be. And that's, um, that's what I believe the evidence to tell me as a historian inspecting the evidence. Um, so, I think, you know, unfortunately, we have a weird, I mean, especially um, in the world of public high schools, uh, how those, how what's taught in high school about American history is in many cases often determined by state school boards and so weirdly varies from state to state. And it becomes just another proxy war for our partisan divide. Um, I, you know, the, I, I, I kind of fascinated to hear you guys say, you know, the paradigm of the culture war is not the answer. Like it was never the answer. I <laughs> agree. But the history wars of the 1990s for, for, for younger listeners who, you know, have never heard of this before. In the 1990s, there, there was a somewhat similar effort. I mean, in some ways, it kind of begins in 1992 with the um, anniversary of the voyage of Christopher Columbus, um, which opens a kind of window that the, 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 for the wider public to see what's been going on in the academy. It's incredibly rich work on indigenous peoples um, and the continuity of indigenous cultures, the work of activists, the ongoing plight of, of native communities in the United States and indigenous communities around the world. And there's in a way, it's not, it's not the same conversation that's going on right now with Black Lives Matter, but there is a kind of a big splashy commemoration moment that that elicits a big conversation. And in some, and to some degree in the aftermath of that, there are national history standards proposed by scholars within the university who wanna have offer, you know, replace existing curricula with a much more inclusive version of the story of American history. There's a tremendous huge backlash from uh, Lynn Cheney at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and, uh, just the whole thing kind of deteriorates into we can't know anything because we can't even agree what happened. Um, that is still sadly going on. Like that's the card that Trump is trying to play with the 1776 commission. Um, I, I think that conversation kind of goes, goes nowhere. There need to be new conversations, which I think, you know, people, people are having, right. That's, that's uh, been one of the really exciting things about, this crappy, horrible, terrible, <laughs> horrible, no good year <laughs> uh, has been, you know, the inspiration of um, activists and people out on the street day in and day out, you know, saying like this, this, that conversation is going nowhere. <laughs> like this, this has to go to a different place. Yeah. Um, towards that end, i um, really curious about, you know, sort of, moving forward. I think a lot of us have experienced a lot of lament, a lot of grief um, in this time. And so what, what would you say to um, sort of returning to truth? If truth is dead, how can it be revived? Um, do you think things will return to normalcy on their own? Or do we as individuals have to sort of reimagine what kind of nation we want to be, what truth means, and take up that work actively? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think normal was that great for a lot of people, right? So the challenge is um, uh, to take this opportunity um, to not squander this suffering, this tragedy, this, this 
the terror, the isolation, the loneliness, the loss, and the grief, um, and kind of, you know, sweep it all into a closet and slam the door and put a lock on it. Like, oh, thank God this over. Cause, cause what's, you know, you know, we're desperately waiting for the pandemic to come to an end um, and for the dying to stop and for people whose lives have been so upended and, and diminished um, to be able to, 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 to get past this moment. But um, I think there's kind of a lot of hard work. I mean, I even just think about I think about it in the, the smallest of ways, right? Like um, if we were, if I was on with you guys, we'd be going out to dinner after this. Like, you know, I go for work with a former graduate student of mine who teaches there now. We talked about how we'd be going to get iced coffee and we'd, I'd get to see campus and feel what the buildings are like and smell the cheese and we'd share a meal and break bread together and this conversation would continue where you might tell me a story about something your toddler said to me, to, said to you, and we, we would be human together. And this, the, for me, like, okay, the injustice, the economic suffering, I don't mean to diminish those things, but the, that we're not allowed to be human with one another. This is not that, this doesn't feel like that to me. I mean, I know it's not nothing, like it's important. And I don't, you know, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful that we can have this conversation. Um, but like, it's it's just different if I step on your coat when I pull up my chair to go to the restroom and then we laugh about how your coat looks like my coat, but my coat looks dingier than yours and how I always, I pack the wrong coat or, you know, just the way you, like that, like that, that is the truth of humanity. Like that's the truth of our shared human condition. And it's, re there are so many forces that make it difficult for us to experience that pre-pandemic. But I think our commitment to seeking that, cherishing that, um, always, always, always. Um, I don't know, I have some hope that our unbelievable appetite for that will make us a, a, a little more willing to be in the company of people that maybe we really disagree with because we just need company so badly. That's 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 probably my flawed hope, but that's that's where I how I get myself to sleep at night. I'm hoping I can be uh, similarly flawed if that is uh, a flawed hope at all. I would crave that kind of flaw. I, I crave those hopes as well. And um, if anything, I think for me that uh, instills in me a sense of of of, of anticipation of yearning for when we can bring you to campus and uh, have another set of conversations uh, about these uh, about these issues and look back on this moment. And, um, and, and I think, and one hopes that by then too, uh, we're gonna be in a better uh, position to sort of think, think in forward looking ways uh, about how we're going to wanna tell the history about our future uh, and um, I, I think you've given us just so much to think about here, and um, uh, and I can't I can't express enough on behalf of all of us our, our gratitude for doing that. And I do, I do hope that we can um, bring you back, and and uh, I'll try not to step on your your coat uh, when we leave dinner, but um, um, feel free <laughs> to step on mine. That's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a great great treat being with you all. Uh, We'll, uh, we're going to virtually uh, thank our, our very special guest, uh, Professor Jill Lepore. Um, we have a couple of just brief announcements that uh, Sarah's gonna share with you. And then again, an invitation to, uh, to join us in, uh, in our little lobby talk, uh, just some informal chit chat. And that's where we, we talk about what a wonderful speaker so-and-so was and uh, how much uh, we hope we'll see her again uh, soon. So. Um, Sarah, would you uh, would you would you uh, bring us out on the on the formal part of our program now? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you all so much for attending. Um, thank you, Jill and Damon and Tracy and John for facilitating that amazing discussion. Um, this event has been recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. So give us a quick Google search um, in a day or two once the video is rendered. Uh, we also have another upcoming event on November 18th featuring 
sort of a similar discussion of the role of truth in the presidential election with Sarah Posner and Anthea Butler. Please join us for that. Information on that upcoming event can be found on our events page at csrc.asu.edu forward slash events. Finally, um, if you appreciate conversations like this, please uh, consider becoming a friend of the center. Um, we really care about the role of truth um, and understanding religion, conflict, and uh, civic public life. So information on how to donate can be found at csrc.asu.edu forward slash support. It's also in the chat. Um, thank you guys for coming. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll move to the more informal discussion. Thanks, now. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so again, much. We're so grateful Bye -bye. to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, so this is our informal lobby talk. Uh, pretend that you're uh, reaching for some of our yummy cookies that we usually have off to one side at the uh, in the lobby or some coffee or, you know, maybe it's just a glass of water. Um, and, uh, each other and... <laughs> yeah, so, um, so uh, Sarah, can you walk us through a couple of comments or questions or uh, things that maybe we should we can chat about here in our virtual lobby? Absolutely happy to. We got a set of questions um, that I think you three will actually be able to speak really profoundly on involving the root, uh, the relationship between truth, science, and especially COVID. So we've gone from fake news up to sort of a denial of science, um, whether it be global warming or COVID, um, sort of a lack of transparency there. So individuals can have their own truths, science, COVID doesn't necessarily. So what do you all imagine is sort of the relationship between legitimacy and credibility and what about American politics needs to change um, to promote truth so that truth and facts um, proceed and not the other way around. Damon, you want to take a stab at that one? Sure. Uh, one of the <clears throat> suspects in the story of who killed truth that didn't come up today, but very much plays a role in Jill Lepore's If Then is advertising. And her book actually opens in a quite powerful way with a story about the ways in which um, the men, and they were men, who tried to build the people machine for Similat uh, uh, the Similmatics Corporation, had these deep connections to the advertising industry. And they, in the 50s, they were already gung-ho about um, bringing advertising and the kind of machinery of advertising research and targeting into American politics. And um, Stevenson and other politicians at the time were very resistant. And part of why they were resistant was um, for reasons that now have become completely uh, powerful and grotesque in our current moment, namely that the core of the advertising industry was how do you tell people what they want to hear in such a way that you can control their behavior, which is to say, get them to buy the thing you want them to buy. And so what you do is you keep telling them message after message after message in a way that grooms them so that they become a consumer of your product. And so as a way of thinking about citizens as consumers and politicians as consumables, um, as commodities of a certain kind. And when you roll that forward, and uh, Joe Laporte does this powerfully in her book, we roll that forward to the current moment in which we have this massive echo chamber of digital technology, ubiquitous digital technology, that certainly gets catalyzed by the forces that we typically associate with the culture war, running on platforms that are run by advertising money most of the time, which means that you've still got this apparatus of trying to tell people what they wanna hear so that they'll buy the thing you want them to buy. You get this supercharged version of what Adlai Stevenson and others were very nervous about in the 50s, Namely, the idea that truth didn't really enter into it, but, but more that we needed products and the selling of those products. And so, you know, whatever uh, other things we might add to the list of 2020, 2020 is also a time in which gaslighting became part of public discourse as a term. And we live in this like vast cloud of gaslighting. And it begins in part with this story of the commodification of politics through America's appetite for advertising. Yeah, if I may, I kind of want to lean into that a little bit. Um, what do you think the role of social media has played? This is a question I think from Justin. 
um, sort of in the dissolution of truth, the growth of information in the US. Um, and how do you think it impact compares with cable television or radio talk shows, sort of earlier mediums of disseminating truth? Um, I think Gaiman is the person to answer that question, but I also want to say here that Jill's anecdote about uh, you know, the, 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 the Silicon Valley mogul who said, well, we're helping the problem of homelessness by teaching people who are homeless to code. That to me is just a stunning example of how the answer is just to assimilate, you know, to incorporate people who are unsheltered are not part of, you know, they're not on Facebook probably, right? They're not part of the, the hive mind. So, so what is the answer? You teach them to code, you bring them into that culture and then that's where we can tweak things. That's where we can make things right. That's where we can make things, uh, things work. So the idea that, um, you know, uh, online culture, Facebook, Twitter has taken over real life. I think that's something that happened in the last few years without many of us noticing that, you know, things like QAnon started out on online, you know, and now we have people actually doing stuff in public that is very, very dangerous and very, very scary because of what they have heard and seen online. So somehow the online world did that, sort of reached out to the person who is unsheltered by that promise that your life is going to be, uh, you know, everything you want it to be if only you live online with us. Um, and, uh, you know, we have sort of accepted that, um, you know, that, that very, very dangerous promise. I just uh, add briefly to that. I, I realized that when I gave my response to the last question, that I didn't actually say anything directly about the science part of it, which was at the heart of that question. But uh, what I was trying to say tacitly is um, we live in a moment now in which there's a kind of flattening in which a scientist's view is just one truth among other truths. And so the kind of advertising dimension of all of this, which is to say you try to say to your constituency slash customer what you think they want you to hear, and you're less interested in the kind of truth lie variable or you know expert non-expert variable. And instead you're looking for what gets people to be in the state of mind that allows them to do what I want them to do which of course ties directly to that question about social media. Um, you know, it, you hear the big four, the kind of big tech companies talk about why they shouldn't be seen as villains or bad guys. And they'll tell you a story about, you know, social media connects. Um, you know, I always think somewhat cynically, like as though we weren't connected before. Of course, the technologies do some things that we like, not least convenience and the rest of it. Uh, but what they don't talk about is the effect of scale with all of this. Um, you have little machines that um, watch what you do and they watch what other people do and they surveil it and they take your data and they give it back to you in a form that tries to nudge you in one way or another. And it's always going and it's always sort of one step ahead. And so I think that in fact, the, uh, the media, you know, the, the old adage that the medium is the message, I think, you know, we're really seeing that with social media. So of course, you know, lying and vitriol and division. And these are old problems. And um, there's a lot to do in terms of cleaning our own houses right now around that stuff. But it also is catalyzed by a machinery which is really built to drive exactly what we're experiencing. Um, interesting set of questions sort of surrounding empirical truth now. Um, so this question says, can you speak to why or why not the scientific method might, pro might provide a means to better determine truth? And all of you are in the humanities. So what, what do you think is the role of the humanities in promoting truth um, in a way that isn't purely scientific or empirical? I was struck that sort of the closing uh, argument in uh, Who Killed Truth, the podcast, was we need to renew our commitment to empiricism. And she says it just like this, we need to renew our commitment to empiricism. We hold these truths. Mm -hmm. So she, she riffs on the very, the least empirical sentence in the, our founding documents, I think, which is which I wanted to bring her out a little bit on that. Didn't happen quite the way that I hoped, but um, what I think she makes a very compelling case for is that you know, empiricism alone will not recover our, our democracy, will not recover our humanity, but my goodness, throwing it out the window means we're, we are dying 
I mean, literally we are dying and we are divided and we are, you know, pulling out guns at each other. And this is what happens when we, when we surrender too easily our commitment to empiricism. So that's sort of foundational, it's bedrock. And then on top of that, we can think about what it means to be human, what it means to, 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 to have a soul. I was very moved by her discussion of juries that this guy, you know, wanted to replace juries with a machine well the machine doesn't know that the fate of you know this one soul is at stake when 12 of us get together to talk about his or her fate so um i i i would like to think about that more that that we can't do without that empiricism absolutely we've seen that we, this year has proven that to us but then that becomes the foundation for a project of being human which doesn't stop there right doesn't stop with uh, i was thinking about the uh, the example to comparing the lie detector test to the role of dna testing today again dna testing can show us some pretty uh, clarifying uh, evidence about whether someone committed a crime or their level of involvement etc it's not completely flawless, of course. But um, that's a very different question about than whether someone should be put to death for committing a crime. And that doesn't solve that question at all. Uh, and so these are important debates. And I, I agree very much about the, the comment about, um, you know, she, she when she was talking about the self-evident truths and, you know, Jefferson's understanding of this being within the Enlightenment frame, that, that's all, of course, Absolutely right. There was also, though, um, a, a number of urgings of others, uh, who, other founders to say, no, no, you have to acknowledge a creator because that's important for some, even if it wasn't as critical for Jefferson. And, um, and, and there's always, and she does talk quite a bit about this, there's always that kind of um, a movement between the, the religious uh, uh, culture and bonds and, and origins of, of political thought, as well as enlightenment ideas. It's not simply it's not simply one or the other. I, I, I agree. I would have liked to be able to pursue that a little bit more. Our colleague, um, Ben Hurlba has put a comment um, in, in, the, in the comments that I think speaks to this. Um, he just remarks that the, the fact that we are talking about truth and lots of people are talking about truth in this moment, in fact, suggests that truth isn't dead. And in fact, that what's very much in play is the question of the relationship of truth to our political institutions and the need to kind of navigate the old democratic question of what truths are gonna count as true in relationship to the institutions we're building with each other. And it strikes me, conversations that we've also had uh, in, in this project, strikes me that there's a kind of Hana Arendt point here that might be made, which is that in the space of politics, what's at stake really is friendship and that friendship doesn't begin with truth as certainty this is the stuff that counts, that's not the stuff that counts, but in fact begins with the persistent um, and never ending um, negotiation around which are the truths that matter and how do they matter and for whom and why and how do we do it. And in fact, what we know in the humanities and the humanities doesn't have a monopoly on this, but what we know in the humanities is the soulful stuff, the stuff that counts the most for us, the stuff that we really cleave to that enters into even the proposition that we should be having friendships as a form of politics. Like these are the kinds of truths that we know are, are the negotiated truths. It makes them no less truth, truthful um, that you can't arrive at some kind of certainty by way of which you could cleave the difference. Um, but instead there's a kind of never ending labor and it's the labor of friendship. Yeah, yeah that just strikes me the, the role of narrative communication of storytelling and promoting truth. And I know that that's something that this project explains a little bit more. Um, did any of you come to like sort of a, an exciting, an exciting reimagination, re sort of invigorated vision of institutions like journalism, like academia, um, like narrative storytelling um, in working with this project? Have you felt inspired by any of the work and thoughts that you've been dealing with recently? Well, I would say broadly, I'm inspired by democracy and democracy is nothing more than the institutions on which it rests, the people and the institutions. So uh, I think our work has reminded us of the vital role of journalists, the vital role of school teachers, of librarians, of historians, of uh, lots of people, it takes all types. Um, and I, I was in really inspired just by, um, uh, by 
Jill Lepore's recounting of how she herself has kind of evolved on thinking about, say, a national history. That's not something that as a first year graduate student, you're thinking, oh, I should be doing looking towards that or even reading those. Um, and, you know, times change, new new conditions arise and it forces you to rethink. Things. That's a good reminder to all of us that that we're not stuck in, you know, in having to be committed to the way we thought at one time. We don't lose our identity simply because we've come to see things a different way or come to see alternative points of view, whether we embrace those alternative points of view uh, or not. I was, I, I found that very inspiring actually. One thing about our project that I also found very inspiring is just the work we're doing with journalists and the immense amount, uh, not only of craft that goes into the, the telling of truth as a journalist, um, but the professional sacrifices that it requires today. That is to say, there's not a lot of money around. There's this constant attack, uh, a constant attack on, on uh, the press by the uh, politicians, some more than others, as we might say. Um, and in all of it, you know that something's deeply at stake. And also there is a risk involved in being a truth teller of this kind. And um, it's really been both a pleasure and an honor, I think, for all of us to work with people for whom this question of truth is not, as it were, academic, but this is really about the difference one might be able to make. Yeah, um, I guess this will be our final question. I, you know me, I'm always looking for hope in these situations, and I think a lot of us are in the same boat. So what can our role be as individuals in recovering truth ourselves? Um, how can we be in the pursuit of it and in the promotion of it? Um, it you know, the, the, the Truth Commission piece that uh, Jill got a lot of bow back on uh, really makes some beautiful points. And I, I'm glad she got a chance to talk about it. But a Truth Commission, first of all, grants amnesty. And maybe that's not what we want. Maybe that's not what we, we uh, need to call need to be calling for. But also that a truth commission can't do the hard work of uh, compelling us to tell the truth to ourselves, mm -hmm. and the truth to each other, and reconciling ourselves to one another. And, uh, you know, I think Gaiman's point about politics is friendship. And, 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 you know, Jill says politics is a pain in the ass, mm -hmm. but we have to do it. Uh, and we can't let a computer do it for us or an online platform do it for us or a lie detector do it for us. I mean, we have to do that messy business ourselves and no truth commission can do that for us. And I'm really, really glad that she closed us out by saying, you know, I just wish I were there with you. I wish we were, you know, telling goofy dad jokes and funny stories about our kids and, you know, drinking each other's drinks by accident. And I wish we were there doing that, that messy fun stuff, because that's where life happens. And that's where the work of truth is done. And I, it, it worries me. I mean, it really does worry me that in responding to the pandemic, so many of us have been really so adaptable. You know, we've been so, it's been so, we've been so good about moving everything online and, and switching to this mode of being together. I think, you know, my kids say it's not that different from, from, what their lives like before they were online so much. And that really worries me. So I hope at the end of this, when we can get offline uh, and do that messy work of being in the same room, uh, we will do it as a, uh, a, a as part of our work of recovering truth that no, 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 no commission, no, um, no algorithm can do for us. I'll tell you three quick things that I think are important uh, in terms of how individuals can commit to truth. Uh, number one is uh, finding good and reputable news sources, uh, but also reading some things that are outside of those and understanding what's the differences in terms of how one story uh, uh, legitimates or, or, uh, or validates something. Uh, just understanding how news networks can independently verify is, is, and understanding how the news works is, is a very helpful thing. Uh, number two, uh, just finding people uh, that you disagree with, in addition to all those that you that you do agree with, and figuring out how deep those disagreements go. I think we've come to see that many times now differences over what were the the, the, the hottest topics and still are very important, don't get me wrong, uh, are not the things that divide us. Those culture war things really are much different now. We have some fundamental work to do, whether 
as a, as a people deciding whether we still, what it means to live in a democracy, what democratic principles are. So I think both of those things. And, and number, number three is understanding also the limitations of truth. They don't help us to, we, we need to acknowledge the truth, but that doesn't help us get over our, uh, our, our issues. We just need that. It, we need to share a common reality in part so that we can argue about the things that we don't share in common. Sarah, do we have time for one more? Yeah. I think uh, uh, crucial is we need to listen. And that sounds like plain and simple as though listening, we're just like, let's stop talking. Let me say as an academic, it's a lot harder than just stop talking because talking is the name of the game. Mm -hmm. But there is a kind of deep listening that's called for. Um, political philosopher Bill Connolly has this term that what we need is to extend our perceptual sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And um, what he means by that is we need to like learn to hear other people in a way that we can understand the world that they're inhabiting. It's a, as it were, kind of the, a, an active practice of empathy. And I wanted to read the last couple of sentences of Jill Lepore's If Then, which I think kind of go to this question of hope, in part because she thinks she's saying things here that are really hard for us to hear. Like when I read it, you'll be surprised. They're not controversial. They're just hard to hear, but they're hard to hear in Bill Connolly's sense of perceptual sensitivity. It's like really perceiving what it means. Um, we're in a university and there's lots of university like our university that's so committed to innovation as a way of getting past some of the contemporary challenges. No doubt that's a part of it. But these simple things, but difficult things like friendship, um, I think are also in play. So I'll just read her last couple of sentences here. She writes, the invention of the future has a long history, decades old, dilapidated. Simulmatics is a cautionary tale, a time-worn fable, a story of yesterday, because tomorrow is not all that matters, nor is technology, or the next president, or the best dog food. What matters is what remains, endurance, and cures. When I first read that, I thought, okay, cures, which cures? Um, but there's something about ending there in the kind of quietness around the things that endure that I think is very hard for us today. Yeah. She didn't leave, uh, she didn't list tweets among those things that endure, <laughs> did she? <laughs> no, I don't see it there. Hey, um, can I uh, extend a special thanks here to uh, Gaiman Bennett and Tracy Pheasanton, and of course to Sarah Lords, our, uh, uh, our, our whiz, um, wizard behind the scenes and behind the curtain who makes all these things happen. So, and thank you to all of you out there in TV land for joining us today. Uh, join us for future events uh, as well. You can find them on our website. So, thanks now. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank Good to see you all.